You are listening to the podcast of the Matyas Corvinus Collegium, the largest talent management institute in Hungary. If you want to know more about our mission, please look up our English website at mcc.hu slash en or check out our Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter channels. For interesting articles and analysis of our professors, external contributors, and students, look up our knowledge base at korvinak.hu slash en. Welcome everyone to this new episode of MCC Podcast. I'm very honored to have Mark Michael Bloom here, who is working in the field of analysis, countermeasures, decontamination, and mitigation of chemical warfare agents for almost more than more than 20 years. Welcome, Mark. Thank you. Thanks for having me. You are here in Budapest these days doing a workshop for, for MCC students as well. And I'm sure you have other meetings in the city. Is that your first time in Budapest? It's not my first time in Budapest, but uh, the last time I've been here is 12 years ago. So this city okay. has changed quite a bit. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So just to, and, and just tell me if I miss anything, you also worked between 2012 and 19 in the laboratory of the organization for the prohibition of chemical weapons. You also led that famous delegation to the UK after the Skripal case, the poisoning of Sergei Skripal and his daughter. Then you worked at the Los Alamos laboratory between 2010 and, uh, and 20, and you're now visiting fellow at the Department of War Studies at King's College London. And I also checked your Twitter when you say in your bio, you say you're a biochemist who tries to help other people saving the world from the bad guys messing around with chemical weapons. Is that a good summary? I studied chemistry. Um, I uh, have a PhD in biochemistry, so I'm a, I'm a hardcore science nerd. <laughs> and then I decided to also do a master's in, in war studies, war in the modern world at King's, because I was always interested in this uh, bridge between the natural sciences and their implication in politics and policy. Yeah, just to start off, and we have discussed it before before started recording, that's a very broad question, but I think it's still necessary for a general audience to, to somehow start to discuss bioweapons, chemical weapons, to to give a bit of an overview of of the of the last century, how, for instance, you know, we all well not remember, but we know from history books the Ypern gas attacks. And we also know if you look back to the very close past, the Navalny poisoning, we mentioned Skripal, there is uh, Kim Jong-nam, the half-brother of Kim Jong-un, uh, assassinated daylight at an airport in Malaysia. So we have all these cases and, and, and topics in mind, but we, I think many of us just don't see the greatest milestones of how, you know, science and and, and the development of chemical weapons enabled such attacks. So if you could just give us a little overview of how, how did it go in the past 100 years? 100 like. years, really <laughs> quick, in a few seconds. I'll try my best. Okay. Um, of course, if you look at chemical weapons, the Ypern gas attack happened at the beginning of World War I. Real big chemical war was only possible after there was a large chemical industry, which came to life in basically the second half of the 19th century. And developments in chemistry at that time, that was the cutting edge high tech industry at that time, comparable to our tech companies we have today. So in World War I, suddenly um, there were shortages of explosives and um, people started to look at the possible use of chemicals. And uh, the first chemical weapons used were industrial chemicals that were around, like chlorine. And only later then chemicals were developed specifically as warfare agents, and the first one there very widely used was, was sulfur mustard, which is even a problem today. So we had very massive use of chemical weapons in World War I, even though the number of fatalities compared to conventional explosives was relatively small. Um, there was no use of chemical weapons in World War II, with the exception there was a use of chemical weapons by Japan in, on the territory of China in the late 30s. Um, but there was uh, otherwise no chemical weapon use, uh, deliberate chemical weapon use on the European theater or also in the rest of the Pacific. But they remained of high interest. And when the, the Cold War started, both um, the Soviet Union and the United States uh, tried to get their hands, uh, for example, on German chemical weapons technology because Germany 
in World War II developed the first nerve agent and mass produced it, but never used it. And of course, then you Sorry, do we know why not? Or This is a tough question, why not? Um, some people say um, Hitler did not order it because he was also injured by a gas attack when he was a soldier in World War I. I think that's a rather weak argument, given that he ordered mass destruction of infrastructure everywhere in the last phase of the war. So why should he shy away from using chemical weapons? It was probably more a logistics thing about getting the armament and munition to the front line at those last stages of the war. Plus, I think simply the military commanders were shying away from using it. It was a weapon they were not really comfortable in using with. They had, didn't have a lot of experience using it. That was not a good use doctrine. Not to mention the transportation. Not to mention the transportation. So it, it was a difficult weapon. I mean, you have a, a, on paper a great new weapon, but you have to make use of it in a good way. And um, that would have taken a bit more than just a few Uh, attacks in the last weeks of World War II. So luckily for everyone, this did not happen. In, during the Cold War, both the Soviet Union and the United States built up very large arsenals of uh, chemical weapon stockpiles. They were also stored very close to the front line of the Cold War. So for example, in Germany, we had chemical weapons both in Eastern and Western Germany. Um, and then uh, towards the end of the Cold War, you saw that Both sides were thinking that there was no real big military use of using chemical weapons. So the Americans decided, to, for example, to take their weapons out of Western Germany in an agreement in 1986. It then happened in real in 1990. And also, also the Soviet side took their weapons out of, of the territory of the GDR. Already in the 80s, there were negotiations started on a possible ban of chemical weapons um, at the Conference of Disarmament in Geneva, but it took several years. It took until 1993 to arrive at an agreed treaty text. And in 1993, the um, Chemical Weapons Convention was opened for signature. And um, it took uh, 65 countries had to join the convention, and then there was a trigger for entry into force. And the 65th country to deposit the instruments of ratification was actually Hungary. So Hungary triggered the entry into force of the Chemical Weapons Convention and um, entry into force was then 1997. And the rules of the convention says that all chemical weapons stockpiles had to be declared and destroyed. And uh, this destruction process is almost um, completed. Originally, the, the main possessor states had until Um, 2012, uh, neither Russia nor the US were able to make it more, for, not for political, but for technical reasons. Um, so they extended that. Um, Russia is done now for a couple of years, but also got significant funding from the West to deal with that problem. The United States will probably be done in 2023. So we have more than 70,000 tons of chemical weapons declared. And there are less than 1,000 tons of chemical weapons left for destruction at the moment. So we are very close to a very significant moment in history where we say every declared chemical is destroyed. Of course, there might be people who cheat, which means they have chemical weapons, but they don't declare them. And we have seen chemical weapons use also after the chemical weapons convention started, either by non-state actors like the Aum sect in Japan attacking was there in the subway in Tokyo. Of course, now in the civil war in Syria, we have seen um, chemical weapon use uh, several occasions, but we've also seen the use of chemical weapons, not as a weapon of mass destruction, but for targeted assassination attempts, like in case of uh, King Yeonnam, Skripal, Navalny. I think the, the big and a bit harsh question is always when it comes to using chemical weapons in these individual cases, When, you want, when someone wants to kill you know, an individual or a smaller group of people, that why didn't they just shoot him in the head? So the use of poison uh, to kill people, I mean, there's a big tradition in it. I mean, from medieval times where it was uh, not uncommon to try to poison a king um, or other noblemen if you didn't like them. However, we are talking here about the use of specific chemicals that were developed as warfare agents for the use in warfare now being used to kill people in assassination attempts. 
yes, you could say, yeah, a car accident or just shooting somebody might be easier, but it also depends what you want to achieve. One possibility would be that you want to send a message. You want others to know about it, and therefore you use something rather exotic. I think we had this in the case, well, not chemically, not related to chemicals, um, in the case of Litvinenko, who was poisoned with polonium in London, um, which is such an exotic way to kill somebody that th there was clearly a message behind it that we, we can get our opponents wherever they are. I think also in case of King Yong Nam, we have a message because he was basically killed in public, on a, on, in the public on a major airport in Kuala Lumpur. Um, and then you use a, a nerve agent that also sent a clear message out that uh, enemies of the North Korean state cannot be safe anywhere. However, I think, especially in case of Navalny, for example, I believe that there was no intention to send a message. There was an intention to disguise the perpetrators. Because um, if everything would have gone according to plan, um, he would have boarded that flight from Tom's back to Moscow. He would have as he did collapse on the flight, he would, and if the pilot would not have diverted the flight to arms, he would have died on the plane. And then he would be taken to a hospital morgue and there would be some general autopsy on him. And a general hospital, even with a general toxicological screen, would probably not have detected the poison. So there was probably the aim to just disguise the perpetrators. So, uh, of course, you can never really be sure why and how, but I think there are different, two different aspects here. Either it's like it's a method to disguise your actions or it's a deliberate message. Yes, and you have just mentioned the case of Navalny. It happened actually almost a year ago on the 22nd of August that, that Navalny arrived in an ambulance car to Charité Hospital in Berlin. Um, like already almost dead and had been poisoned with, with a nerve agent called Novichok. How could he survive then? The fact that Navalny survived um, is due to the very courageous actions also, first of all, of Russians. The pilot of the plane who said, I will divert my flight to Omsk and I land immediately because we have a life-threatening situation on board. And then also the very first treatment he received by the paramedics, even already on the airfield, and then the initial treatment he got at the hospital. That saved his life, this general intensive care he got there. Um, he arrived at the Charité in Berlin, and the, 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 so the Charité Berlin team published a scientific paper in a journal called The Lancet, which is one of the, the major medical scientific journals where you can, and it's open access, where you can read also about the blood values and how he treated him. And he arrived there in a very, very sick state, um, life-threatening condition um, with um, a major class of, of enzymes you need for living. The choline esterase is almost completely blocked, which is characteristic for these kind of agents. And then it became apparent to the Charité that something was wrong there. And then they turned for help to a German military laboratory, which, by the way, at the same time also is a certified laboratory of the OPCW, the Organization for the Prohibition of Chemical Weapons, to analyze blood samples. And they found that an agent from the Novichok class was used. And then, of course... Um, it was clear, okay, just an army laboratory, if we go public with this, the German government realized they needed backup and additional analysis. So they asked through the EU, um, France and Sweden to also analyze the samples. They came to the same result and conclusion. And they asked the OPCW to send a team to Berlin, take blood from Navalny and then have it analyzed by two additional labs, which are unidentified. And they all, so five labs in total, came to the same conclusion. And that, of course, helped the Charité to target their treatment. But in the end, the general intensive care he got is what, him, what saved him. And he interestingly stayed about almost the same, exactly the same number of days in hospital as Julia Skripal did. Um, so the, the, the kind of recovery, you have to give your body the time to, to remake this enzyme. And that takes about three, four weeks. And such a nerve agent, like 
in five, 10 years can absolutely disappear. So does it have like long-term effects? So in the body, after, after several weeks, you will not detect it anymore. Again, because your body is remaking these enzymes and the rest will be, well, the body also clears up old stuff. So this will be gone after some time. Um, and the primary effects of nerve agents are quite well understood. However, the long-term effects of, of, of these organophosphorus agents are not that well understood. Um, there are some pesticides which are very similar to the nerve agents, which are known to have um, long-term neurological effects. The point is there are sim there's simply not enough data because there are only a handful of people who have knowingly been poisoned with it. So we know now there's uh, the Skripals, there's this one police officer in the UK. Then there was um, Charles Rowley and Dawn Sturgis. Dawn Sturgis was the woman who died. Um, and then we have Navalny, and this is basically the cases we know, and this is not a lot of data. Um, so there's a lot of, there's a big question mark if there will be long-term long health effects. And I'm very interested in this, in, in this question that I'm about to pose because you were there on the field with the OPCW mission in the UK after the poisoning of Skripal. How can you compare the two cases? I mean, the case of Skripal and Navalny. So the, the task the OPCW played in the Skripal case, it's, it's very similar to what the OPCW did in the Navalny case. So the United Kingdom requested the OPCW to provide technical assistance in the form that a team would be sent, take samples independently, so not just receive samples from the UK, but take own samples, go to the hospital and, and take blood samples, for example, from the Skripals, then take them home to the Netherlands, the headquarters of the OPCWs in The Hague, and then have it analyzed by certified OPCW laboratories. So the UK wanted a confirmation of their analytical findings by an independent international body. And Germany did the same in case of Navalny. So the OPCW's involvement there was more like confirming what was basically already known by the UK and Germany. The cases are, of course, different because in case of Skripal, we had, uh, so Sergei Skripal, a former uh, GRU military intelligence agent who then became a double agent, uh, was arrested, spent some time in jail, and then was exchanged and uh, went to the UK for basically retirement and lived close to Salisbury, in Salisbury. Um, so we have that case, somebody being poisoned on British soil, while Navalny, Russian citizen, being poisoned on Russian soil. And this also is, of course, um, important in terms of investigating the poisonings. Because um, Navalny being poisoned in Russia, this is the task of Russian authorities to, to launch an investigative probe. Germany could not do that. Only if Navalny would have died in Germany, German prosecutors could have launched an investigation. But otherwise, this is a crime happening to a Russian citizen. It happened in Russia, so it's outside of the jurisdiction of German law. Um, so the only people who can really investigate and find out what happened are the Russians themselves. Um, while, of course, in the Skripal case, you had the UK um, police and, and the prosecutors there investigating the case. Do you have any guess or do we know why Novichok is so popular? I mean, surely there are any other, many other nerve agents. There are, um, um, there are certain properties of these agents which make them attractive, like there's a certain time lag between your exposure and the time when you develop symptoms. Like, I mean, the, the Skripals um, probably most likely exposed at their home at the doorknob and then they still drove into town, they went to a pub and had a beer and they still had lunch and only afterwards they collapsed. So there are some hours. And same with Navalny, um, what is currently known publicly at least that he was poisoned um, through his clothing, um, which he put on in the morning and then he still had time to go to the airport, drink Actually, the, it was, drink it the was in his It was in his underwear. Underwear, yes. Yeah. Go, go there, have a tea before he left, because lot, for a long time people believed the poison was in the tea. Then bought the air, aircraft and still fly for some time before then collapsing. So um, there is some time. It's very hard then to actually nail down where the exposure has happened. So you collapse a few hours later, like where have you received the poison? That's very difficult with this. And I think also, I mean, there might 
these chemicals were developed for use in warfare again. They were not developed for individual targeted assassinations, but um, I put it that way, you develop this as a chemical weapon ban, you can use it and can't use it anymore, but you have this fantastically great hammer. So, and the one nail you want to hit with it is gone. So you are looking for new nails because you have this fantastic hammer and you would like to use it, so you're looking for new nails. But for instance, in the case of Litvinenko, polonium, as you've already said, had a different message. And also maybe in the case of Kim Jong-nam, the usage of VX was also very, very different from Novichy. Why? I mean, it also means where did the exposure happen? Where I mean, uh, Kim Jong-nam, th there were two women actually smearing chemicals in his face. And the, so there were two components, non-toxic components, and only on his face these two components mixed and the poison was formed, which then actually incapacitated him in a very short time. Um, there was no several hours lag time. He uh, basically reported that this happened and he collapsed a few minutes after. Um, so there was a clearly, clearly the intention that this would be happening almost in public. Um, while the poisoning on the, well, I think it was intended that he would be on, Navalny would be on the plane when he would collapse. Um, but again, then there would be the question like, was this, what was the cause of death? Why did he really collapse? There could be a lot of other reasons, of course. So people would be shocked probably, oh God, he collapsed on a flight. But the real cause, the nerve agent, would, would probably have been hidden for a while or completely. And um, so there is a bit the difference again between message and, and um, hiding who, of the perpetrator and, and the general case that people were poisoned. Yeah, and since we are talking about bio and chemical weaponry on this podcast, I would really use this opportunity. I think it's a great occasion to make well, a scientific voice heard on a deliberately over-politicized issue. It's COVID. <laughs> we are in an almost post-COVID period, more or less, in the Western world. And we've just started to revive, but there are still a bunch of questions about that particular UN lab, what happened there, and... Uh, how the virus could escape. What can you say to those who see or want to see COVID as a global bioweapon? Because there are many stories on the internet. I think it's really important that at least we are trying to clarify or collect the facts for those interested. Sure. Um, well, one of the big problems, of course, with the probe into the origins of, of the corona SARS-CoV-2 virus and where it has originated is we had a probe already conducted by the World Health Organization together with China, where the report was for many parties unsatisfactory. And uh, people also said that the cooperation of China was at best limited. And there was definitely no full transparency as would be required in such a case. Now, very recently, it has been popular to talk about the lab leaked theory so that the COVID virus was released from the, the Wuhan Institute of Virology, for example, as a lab accident. But that is still very different, that theory, from saying COVID is a deliberately engineered, made bioweapon. That's completely different because that would mean that you take viruses and you change their properties deliberately to make them, say, more contagious and more deadly or more dangerous, and then, then such, such a virus would have leaked. What we do know is, and this is also why the institute in Wuhan exists, is that in the area of Wuhan you have populations of bats that carry many, many viruses, also still unknown and uncharacterized viruses, and, and these bats are basically a a source for many new potential diseases. So it's very well justified to study them and to find out what exists there. What we also know is that the virus, the, the SARS-CoV-2 virus, <clears throat> in all likelihood didn't come directly from the bat to the human, but that there is an intermediate host 
another animal in all likelihood, uh, which is still unknown, which is also a bit of a problem because you would like to know what that intermediate host animal uh, species is. But this has happened before that it came from the bat, it went through an animal, and from the, that animal it went to humans. We have seen this with SARS, the first SARS virus, and also with MERS, who are very dangerous. Um, they are far more deadly, SARS and SARS-1 basically, and MERS far more deadly than SARS-CoV-2, but far less contagious. So they didn't develop into a global pandemic. So there's the question mark people like to know more about. Then there's the intransparency of China into the original probe. So people might still think, hmm, so could it have, could the virus be already at the Wuhan Institute and then maybe just a worker there infected himself, maybe was, an, was a COVID case which are without symptoms and he just carried it out. It's hard to rule that out. Um, it's very hard to rule that out, but there are also a lot of other equally likely explanations where it comes from and uh, that it jumped from an, the bat to the animal to humans is still the most likely explanation. People have looked very closely at the, the, the genome of the SARS-CoV virus and um, tried to see if there are common origins and common ancestors, but there was no sign whatsoever that really this is engineered that there was some genetic engineering on that virus and this is actually manu manipulated by man. There's no real evidence for that. So at the moment, of course, this leaves a lot, and you said highly politicized discussion, was this a lab leak or was it not? It doesn't help us very much with the global pandemic at the moment. Of course, the blame game, that's a political game. And uh, of course, I, so I understand we need to find out what happened to stop the next one. But at the moment, with SARS-CoV-2, this doesn't help us because the virus is out there. And, and, and we know that. One thing with biological weapons, and, and SARS-CoV-2 is a very good example for it. They are totally unpredictable weapons, and therefore they are also bad weapons. If you use... You um, cannot control highly, them. You cannot it? control them. So bacteria and viruses in humans, they multiply. So you have a self-replicating weapon. And... If it's too contagious, uh, it will get out of control, especially if you have a new virus for which there is no general immunity in humans. And it will spread around the globe, and especially in our modern times with air travel and this very high mobility, you have seen this, is, this traveled around the world within weeks and months. If you compare that, we had the, the Spanish flu um, at, at the end of World War I, 1918, 1919, 1920, which also killed millions of people. Um, still a bit forgotten that there was a global uh, um, pandemic. Um, and interestingly, the Spanish flu doesn't come from Spain. It's named the Spanish flu because the, the Spanish, uh, I think, king at that time was very severely ill. Um, but it also came from somewhere else because the world was just a much slower place back then and still relied on travel by ship, the spread of the pandemic around the globe was much slower. Um, but we have to learn our lessons for the future about how to contain pandemics before they come, become pandemics. Um, but there's, of course, also there was so little knowledge at the beginning, um, and you know that probably from the news where people speculated how deadly is it really, how contagious is it really, do we really need a mask, a good protection, is this an airborne virus or not? It took time to find that out, even though... And it's still a conversation in many places, actually. It's still a conversation in many places, but lots of scientists have spent very, very long working hours in the past years since the start of the pandemic, actually, to find these things out. Um, and then it's up to political decision makers to take the right conclusions from this. Well, I hope and, um, and we hope and I'm sure that we are going to see clearer in a, in a few years after this whole pandemic ends. Dr. Bloom, thank you very much for your time and for being here with us on MCC Podcast. Thank you for having me. Thank you for listening to this MCC Podcast episode. For further media content, please look up our English website at mcc.hu slash en or look for us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. If you want to read more by our professors, external contributors, and students, check out our knowledge base at korvinek.hu slash en.